It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tim Jeanette. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jeanette, the Metal Meeple, and in this video we're taking a look at Decatur the Game. It's published by Radio Taper. Uh, I believe it was designed by Jim Swift, though in the rulebook or anything it doesn't really specify any of that. It might be on their website, but this is a new company, brand new game. This is their first game being published. It takes about 120 minutes is what they say, maybe between an hour and two. It's for three to seven players, and it's a game similar to like Risk where you're trying to take over area. So kind of an area control fighting game. Not really fighting, but anyway, it takes place in the Eastern Hemisphere, and you've got these prosperity cards that you have a few, everyone has a few, there's some face up on the table, there's five different regions, and you're trying to move your troops and guys into areas where you think is going to be the most prosperous. And then at the end of one of the four intervals, all that stuff changes and fluctuates, and at the end of the game, whoever has the most guys left on the board is the winner. Pretty interesting concept. Is it a good game? Let's uh, take a look at the components, and I'll show you how to play it, and we'll come back, and I'll tell you what I think. You are the head of a vast enterprise, chartered by the Crown to engage in commercial activities in the Eastern Hemisphere. As such, you will maneuver your company's representatives into prosperous regions. You will leverage your influence with the established commonwealths. You will weigh the need for a merchant navy. But above all, you must navigate changing economic conditions. Now, that's the description of the game. And here's the board setup. It's pretty light. It doesn't start with any pieces in play except for the pawn up here at the top. This is the interval pawn. You're essentially going to have four different intervals. You have the clock marker, which represents the round that you're on, and you have some dice that are used for various reasons. Other than that, it's a blank, and uh, you're going to go on to setup. So I'm not going to go over every rule, but I'm going to uh, try to cover a lot of it so you get a general sense of how to play the game. But essentially, each player is going to receive a bunch of tokens. You've got seven players, so you've got seven uh, different sets of tokens. Um, each set of token can, is comprised of three different pieces. You have factors, which are these small little uh, squares. You have ports, which are circles. You have six of these. And you also have six of these ship tokens, they're called fleet tokens, that come out with your port. Um, on top of that, each player is going to receive a reference card that has basically everything that you can do on your turn and different things, like different charts throughout the phases. And you have the end of round interval on the back and all its steps. So you get that. Each player is also going to receive one influence card from the influence deck. These influence cards represent different uh, influence you get from regions. Uh, one of the cool things about them is they do have all the dots on the board. You've got these different little circles here where you're going to put your, uh, your pieces to take over different areas. And it shows you where you're going to get bonuses at. Uh, so you don't have to constantly look at the board and find those symbols. Um, and each different one, there's five different commonwealths. They give you uh, the list of all the different symbols. Anyway, each player gets one of these. You also get two prosperity cards. These prosperity cards are five different ones. They match the different color regions on the board. You've got Oceania. You have East Asia, Middle Asia, Europe, and Africa. And, of course, each of these correspond to those. Uh, you're going to give each player two of these that they're going to keep face down in front of them. They can look at them, but no one else can. And then depending on the number of players, you're going to put one face up on the board. So in a five-player game, you're going to put five of these face up. And to make it easier, you can place them into, like, near the areas of what they are. So, you know, I guess Middle Asia's and East Asia, you got your Europe card over here. Next, you're going to determine who the first player for the game uh, will be. You're going to take one factor from each player, um, so one of these symbols, or one of these little squares. You're going to put them, uh, the game says to put them in a coffee cup, and it's called the Cup of Reckoning. You shuffle them up in the cup and you draw one out. Whoever you get is going to be the first player. That way they can't be first player again. Uh, and you give them the coffee cup to determine uh, that they're the first player. But we skip that and we just use the box lid, so... Whatever, not a big deal. Anyway, after you determine the first player, you're ready to begin. The idea of the game is that you're trying to put troops on the board. They're called factors, those little squares, and move them around into areas in which you think are begin going to be prosperous at the end of each interval. So you'll play a bunch of rounds. It will end 
and then everybody's going to reveal those prosperity cards, and then whichever area has the most is going to get bonuses or negatives, depending. Uh, basically, if you had you know the most here uh, in Africa, then all these different spaces are going to move the the factors down. And anyway, the point is, you're trying to get as many guys on the board as possible, but they're going to fluctuate depending on which area you're at uh, in at the end of the interval. After four intervals, the game will end, and whoever has the most factors in play will be the winner. So. Sounds a little confusing, but let me show you uh, how the game plays. During a player's turn, you're going to have one action you can perform of seven actions that are available to you. Uh, one of the actions, which you're pretty much going to do as your first action of the game, is called restructure. You can do restructure once per interval, but more than likely, you're probably only going to do it at the very beginning of the game and maybe one other time if you happen to have less than seven guys in play. The reason is because you get to take First off, you clear the entire board of all your pieces except for ports and fleets. So basically you're just clearing the factors. And then you're going to get to place seven of these in one spot that's empty, such as uh, the Horn of Africa here, or one spot that you already control with a port. So let's say you choose Restructure, and you're going to place your seven pieces on the Horn of Africa. The second action you can choose is Venture. Venture is pretty much going to be one of the ways you can get your pieces to other places. When you Venture, you're going to choose one of your friendly areas, so let's say here, and you can move to an adjacent area. You can also move through an ocean to a coastal area, so you couldn't move inland up here. Or you can also move uh, across an ocean, so if you're over here, you can move across the Atlantic Ocean through the Indian Ocean, and land over here in India. So you can go one one ocean across, but you couldn't cross two oceans, and there's three oceans on this board. So anyway, that's uh, Venture. If you happen to venture into a, a, a territory that's empty, you just move your guys there, as many as you want from that from that spot. Otherwise, if you move into an area that already has uh, a player's tokens that's not yours, obviously, you're going to uh, cause a hostile takeover attempt, which we'll get into uh, that later. Now, as you move guys around, you're going to get them split up to try to take over different areas because you want to take over as many in a region as you can if you think that region's going to be prosperous at the end of the round, meaning it has the most of these prosperity cards in play, which you pretty much know about half of these because you get one per player and you get two in your hand. So in a five-player game, you at least have seven of the 15 cards. So it's give or take 50%. But anyway, if you choose to expand, which I think maybe it should have been called reinforce because you're not really expanding outside you're just increasing the amount of troops you have in play uh, you get to take two factors and place them one a piece on two different regions so you can place one here and you can place one here but you couldn't put both on the same you can also create a port uh, when you create a port you're going to take a port token and the fleet token and place it in one friendly coastal area so you could build a port here and here and here but you couldn't build a port you know up here because it's not coastal to anything but a port's always going to cost you two, plus the number of ports you already have in play. So the first port's only going to cost two. You're going to choose an area that at least has two of your uh, factors. You're going to remove those and put a port in its place. And the port will give you defensive bonuses uh, for when people try to take over that area. After you build the port, you get a fleet token in which you get to place in the adjacent ocean. So the Indian Ocean, it's usually best to keep all these fleet tokens from all the players next to the name of the ocean so they're not spread out and people get confused on how many points you're getting from fleet tokens. Uh, some of the areas, such as South Africa here, um, is next to two oceans, and when you place a port there, you actually get to pick which one of the two oceans you want to put it in. Each ocean can only have two of your fleet tokens, so if you already had two in the Atlantic, you would have to put the other one over here. Another action you can do is consolidation. Consolidate uh, will allow you to take one area, such as, say for instance, I wanted to strike uh, this the player up here in Egypt, it allows you to combine a lot of your forces, because as you move around, your units are going to get spread out, and you want to combine them so you can go to one place all at once. So if you consolidate, you choose an area, you can choose any friendly adjacent area, plus any coastal area in the same ocean. So this is an Indian Ocean. Any guys I had over here um, could also join forces. So if I choose this, I can move as many factors onto that space and, and build up that little force there. The final two actions you can take revolve around the influence cards. The first one is simply to draw an influence card. Now again, you start with one of these, but you might want more. 
The reason is because they're going to give you bonuses to attack and defense uh, or hostile takeover attempts, as they're called, on areas with that same symbol. So if you needed uh, to go after Egypt, you would want a lot of these crescents. Now, if you happen to draw and you have, you're allowed to have three in your hand and three up on the table. So if you draw a fourth one, you're going to have to choose one of these and place it face up on the table in front of you. If you draw another one, you'd have to do the same thing. And eventually, if you had three on the table, such as these three, and three in your hands, when you draw one, you would have to resolve it in your hand it down to three. You'd have to put one on the table and then resolve those down to three as well, discarding the last one. Let's say, for instance, you are needing to get out of this area because, like I showed you, it has the different, um, cr you know, all the crescents are in these areas right here. But say you want to go over this side of the map and start taking stuff over. Well, now you're going to need different symbols. The last action you can take is to exchange influence cards in which you take all the same symbol. So let's say these uh, three crescents and that crescent. You're going to reveal them all to the players. I've got four. I'm going to discard these. And you get to draw four new influence cards. And then you resolve it the same way. You put one on the table. You discard down to three onto the table. And whatever you have over three on the table also get removed. So you only can have six maximum. When you choose the venture action and you choose to move guys into a spot where another player's uh, troops are or their factors are, it's going to cause a hostile takeover attempt. You're going to try to move your guys into that spot and kick them out. In order to determine who wins, the contender, who's the attacker basically, is going to determine his strength and then compare that to the defender's strength as well. So each factor is worth one. So this player has one, two, three, four, five. Each port is worth two, but this player doesn't have a port. Uh, each fleet token in the same ocean as the area you're going to gives you one. So he's got five, six, and uh, versus the defender, which has two, three, four, five, six. So it's six on six, but the attacker, let's just say, had this influence card in front of him. Again, any symbol on the space that you're going after, if you have a matching card in play, that also gives you plus two, which can you can use these tokens they give you. Um, Let's see if I'll focus there. Give you influence plus two. You can use these as a reference instead of putting the cards out on the table. But essentially, this guy has eight versus six. The defender is now required to play a card. Uh, since he can't commit any guys, he needs to play a card to get to eight or higher. Since influence cards always plus two, he's going to choose to do a card. So he puts a card down, and now it's eight on eight. Defender will win ties, but the attacker happens to have another one in his hand. Uh, which is good to keep these in your hand instead of face up on the table because then people can determine what your strength is immediately, uh, whereas if you have them in your hand, they're a surprise. Once the combat is determined resolved, as in somebody wins or somebody loses, the attacker is going to roll the dice for attrition and reference the sheet that they got at the beginning of the game. In this case, attrition. If you um, have a, rolled a 2 to 5, in this case we rolled an 8, so... Neither player will lose it. A six to eight, the loser's going to lose it, which happens most common out of uh, two dice added together. Uh, six out of dice. Nine to 12, both players are going to lose. So in this case, the loser's going to lose one. Let's say the attacker won. He's going to lose a factor and then move his troops to an adjacent spot. As long as that spot is empty or friendly, he can also move them to a friendly location in the same uh, C zone, it, You know, as long as he has a friendly uh, area to go to. If not, they get removed. Um, Either way, he moves on there, and he's also going to remove this port. If the defender lost, he's going to move his guys back to the same spot he came from. Now, there's another thing you can do uh, when you do the venture. You can cross a C. If you happen to go attacking a player that's not adjacent, and you want to, say, go from here. Um, let me move this map down. Say you wanted to go from here to east of Europe. You could, since they're in the same ocean, or at least one ocean away. But the defender will always receive a logistics bonus of plus two because you crossed a C zone instead of uh, going to an adjacent spot. After each player has taken a turn, the first player is in charge of moving the round track to the next spot available on the board, which it starts here at one. It's going to move to the next spot. For some reason, if he forgets to do so before taking his action, any player may yell Decatur really loud and that and they can enact a uh, penalty upon the first player. Say, for instance, the first player had a couple guys over here. Um, 
and one guy right here, he can choose to remove one of these factors. Now, you can't remove a factor if it's going to cause the player to lose full control of an area, but he could remove this one since he has two. The game's going to keep going. Each player is going to have a turn on each one of these uh, rounds. Once it hits this clock, the clock token's going to flip over. Now, if the clock moves on to the four, any of these four shaded areas, the first player is going to roll the dice. If it is a multiple of the number it's on, the round will end and you'll go on to the end interval um, sequence. If you don't roll, so say we got a six, it's now multiple four, we move another round, and then we go to three, we roll again, goes again, and eventually it's going to end because everything's a multiple of one. But say it ends here, as soon as it ends, you're going to flip the clock face down and go on to the end round phase. Once the interval ends, each player is going to reveal the prosperity cards they have in their hand and put them on the table, pretty much in the same little piles as the starting ones. So let's say in a five-player game, we're going to reveal ten of these. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Now what you're going to do is use the tokens to determine which uh, area is first place down. So whatever area has the most cards, which I believe is Europe, it's got one, two, three, four, five. It's going to receive the four token. Three tokens going to go to the second place, which we have a tie for East Asia and the um, Oceania. On the reference card, it does have a tiebreaker, basically. In intervals one and three, you're going to go from left to right. Intervals two and four, you go from right to left. So in this case, we have East Asia, Oceania. Oceania is first. It's going to receive the three marker. You've got the two marker on East Asia. One marker is going to be, oh, we have another tie. So Middle Asia and Africa. Middle Asia wins in the first interval. And then we have a skull and crossbones there. What this does is the whole point of the game, you're trying to determine where you want to go. So because at the end of the interval, all these are going to be modified. So for instance, the four is up here. Every spot that a player controls, their factors are going to be modified to four. So if they only had one factor in a spot, they're going to get three extra factors there to bring them their total of four. This space would get uh, modified to four, et cetera, and et cetera. Now, if you had too many, it also goes down. Each spot has a maximum of seven. So if you had seven here, because you try to go in at the, la at the end of the round and kind of start taking over this area, but you ran out of time then this would go from seven down to four. So you want to be careful on how many guys you try to take over each area. This area down here, each spot would get three. This area over here, each spot would get two, one. Now the skull and crossbones will remove every player's piece or every player's factor from that region. So all these factors go away, except for ports, you do maintain those. After that, each player that has duplicate influence cards in play, not the ones in their hand, are going to discard those duplicates. This keeps players from hoarding onto the same symbols throughout the whole game and dominating an area, even though that might not be beneficial to them based on how these cards come out anyway. Next, you're going to pick up all the prosperity cards, shuffle them in with the deck, deal two out per player again, and one on the, fa on the table face up for each player. Then you must determine the first player again by taking the Cup of Reckoning, pulling a token out of it, and that player is going to begin the game for the next interval. You move the pawn to the next interval. In a long, or I'm um, not long, but in a normal game, you're going to play four intervals, or in a short game, you can play three. And at the end of the fourth interval, or third interval, depending on if you're, what version you're playing, whoever has the most factors, not including ports, on the board is the winner. And there you go. That's Decatur the game. So what do I think? The gameplay is actually pr surprisingly good. I mean, it's a nice take and a nice variant on the whole strategy area control risk style game and where you're trying to capture different regions and things like that i like that there's no player elimination and i like the fact that you have those prosperity cards that kind of randomly determine and you got to figure out what other players are doing and, and, and be like ah oh, he's going after that so he must have two of those cards and then you get to the end of the interval and you're like you didn't even have any of those cards why are you going after that stuff so pretty cool it's got some interesting uh flow to it and it's real fast i mean each player as long as they're not prone to AP, each player will take their, their turn pretty quick. So a lot of the concern I have with the game, though, comes from the graphic design and the components and such. So the player tokens are extremely hard to differentiate, differentiate if you have a lot of players. If you're playing like five, six, and seven players, 
all those tokens are the same. I mean, they got this like gray background with like a logo in the middle. Some of those logos share very similar colors. And if you look at it at a distance, it's really hard to just get a, a, a initial atmosphere of what's happening at the moment. So if they were bordered with different colors, or even if they were just wooden cubes of different colors, it might be easier just to get a glance and see what's going on. The uh, locations are, you know, some of them, we're not geography majors, but, you know, if you don't have any reference and you're just looking at this game, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell what's coastal and what's not coastal. Because that came up a lot. Like, I'm pretty sure that's coastal to both these oceans. I think it's coastal just this. I don't even think Russia's coastal. But we were reading a rule in the rule book that it says it does, an example. So I think that maybe if the circles around each location were color-coded to the if they were just gray, it's landlocked. If it was, you know, one dark blue, it's this ocean. If it's light blue, it's this ocean. Maybe half and half if it's if it's bordering two different ones. That could have helped a lot. Also, the Commonwealth symbol, like the little star and the bear and things like that, if those were on the outside of the circle, it would make it a lot easier because players would tend to just cram all their tokens on top of the circle, and you couldn't even see anything as far as the name or the symbol anymore. So if you start moving pieces around to see what Commonwealth is there, other players are like, oh, he's going after that. So, uh, I mean, those are little things, and it's not a huge deal. Uh, the player reference sheet um, – <clears throat> This is just bland. I mean, I could download this off of uh, Board Game Geek and, and print it. The, it's quality paper. All the components are actually nice. I just think that maybe if there was a second printing or a revised edition or something, they can go through and add more artwork, and it would just pretty up the game a lot. Um, the, the theme to me, I, I picture this game more of like an abstract game, honestly, as far as the gameplay. You could literally just like there was a Risk bookshop, bookshelf game where it's like very minimalistic and I, I picture it more like that. I guess this takes place in like the 1800s or something. The name of the game has nothing to do with it. I emailed the designer and he was like, it's just a place he grew up in and there was a, maybe an explorer or somebody who was named Decatur uh, around the time. The only reference to the game is actually on the bottom of the board at the bottom left. I didn't show you in the video, but essentially it says Decatur, Illinois is 8,000 miles that way. Kind of silly in a strategy game, but whatever. So anyway, the theme is kind of just, uh, I don't know. It says you're trying to, to monitor these like economic conditions and stuff, but it seems like maybe you're fighting and taking over areas. So is it a, a combat game or is it more like, I don't know. So in, in the locations, there's a little bit of mismatch. You know, we've got like Egypt and things like that. And then you got like just basic things like Far East and East China and South Africa. So to me, it was just a disconnect. Not a big deal because honestly, I can see this game just being completely abstract and it would be fine. Uh, the only thing, uh, everything I said before this, kind of minor. Maybe the components can be spiced up and such. But the only rule I have with the game as far as what do I not like, the Decatur rule, which I guess is the other thing that Decatur's mentioned in the game. But as the first player, if you don't move the round token and somebody yells Decatur and gets to remove your piece, garbage. Should never have been in the game. I feel like maybe they were playing one night or a couple nights and some dude in their group would just kept uh, not doing it. And they're like, hey, you know, if you don't stop doing this, we're going to enact a rule into this game to, to obviously get you to stop. The reason I feel that way is because that's more of a party game rule. And if you're playing something like chess and you forgot to, like, say I'm done or something and they get to, like, remove a pawn, it'd be like this has nothing to do with the game. The The word is not even an action. It doesn't have anything to do with it. So. I don't even think it should be a variant rule. Now, maybe that's opinionated, so let me approach it from a different aspect or a different approach. As far as rules are concerned, it's not a balanced rule either because in the game there's four intervals. Uh, one, on each interval, a player is going to be first player. So there can only ever be four first players. If you're playing five, six, and seven players, or even three, which will have multiple Every player is only going to be first player one time. So why make it to where only four people are going to be subjected to that rule? And on, the, on top of that, you could possibly go, I think it's like nine rounds that you can actually have that happen to you. Now, if you don't learn by then, obviously you should just, you know, not be first player again. But why even have that rule? I don't know. I just think that even in a rules perspective, it's not balanced as far as gameplay goes. Other than that rule, though, everything else, as far as the rule book, it's kind of bland. I mean, it gives you the idea. I had to read it a couple of times to really get everything and make notes just to make sure I didn't miss anything because the terminology is a little bit different than 
current rule books and how they're written. So if this was rewrote a little bit and spiced up graphic wise, it'd be great. Overall, I think it's a pretty decent game. And if you are interested in any type of game like this, I would recommend checking it out. I don't know their distribution methods, but you can at least go to Radio Tupper, uh, Taper Game, or sorry, it's Radio Taper, so T A P I R dot com, I believe, uh, or just Google Decatur the game, and you should be able to find it. And I believe you can get it from them. And other than that, it might show up online or in stores. So, anyway, uh, let me know what your thoughts are, and take you know if you want to email me, it's timjanette at gmail dot com. Let me know what you think. Comment below. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. <laughs>